Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. We're up here in Severna Park today with Dana Steibolt, who is the owner of, I would say it's one of my favorite stores. Uh, sometimes it is my favorite store if I'm buying, but if I'm repairing, I'd rather not be here. But MacMedics on Benfield Road. How are you today, Dana? I'm well. This is awesome. Um, we've been meaning to get in touch with you for probably a while, and I know it's taken some time to get together and just to talk a little bit about MacMedics, and I am a huge fan of MacMedics. You are one of the, I guess, Apple premium service provider. That's correct. And what, is, what does that mean? Well, it just means we're an Apple authorized service provider uh, operating at the highest level. The uh, premium service provider designation is actually going away and they'll just tag us as an Apple authorized service provider down the road. But for the time being, it's still premium service provider. And okay, so you are authorized by Apple to do what? We can fix anything that uh, Apple makes, past, present, or future, in or out of warranty or under Apple Care Plus, which is Apple's insurance. Okay. And you also sell Apple stuff, obviously. Yep. We're an Apple authorized reseller, and we sell everything that the Apple Store sells minus the watch and the iPhone for the exact same price. Okay. So there is no difference in price on this? Not uh, between us and Apple, no. Right. I mean, obviously, if they have an in-store rebate or something that they do, obviously, that's not. But, I mean, it's so if I go to the the mall and I want to buy the new Purple Mac, uh, I can buy it here at the same price. Yep, twelve ninety nine, same exact price. That's awesome. No, no higher taxes in Severna Park than there are down in Annapolis or anything. Not, not yet. yet. <laughs> not, not yet. We think we think alike. We think alike. But you do have currently have two locations: one in Lanham, uh, which is on uh, Parliament Place, which is not super convenient to the metro, but not super inconvenient. Yeah, it's actually uh, it's actually right off of Route fifty and. It's um, at the Martin Luther King exit. Okay. And our office is actually right on the off ramp of 50. So you come off 50, stay on the exit ramp, turn right, and our office is right there. Or Benfield Road, which is as you just head into Severna Park off of 97, I guess you go Benfield and head toward Ritchie Highway, and it's right on the right. Yep. Very easy to get to. And I will say, I've often said often too that uh, people are like, why are you going up to Severna Park for this? I'm like, because by the time I get to by the time I get to the mall and park and get in and you know where you get in wait in line and, and check in and everything else I can be up here in here and transacting business in in the same amount of time or, or close to it anyhow so I think that it's um, good and one of the things that I like about this is that the folks that you have here you've really invested in your employees and your staff and one of the very first things we did is my daughter was going to school and she needed this computer and the battery was dying and I took it into the mall, and they're like, oh, well, we're going to need to send it out. It's going to be a minimum $200 for a look and whatnot because we think there might be some water damage. Uh, and I said, well, I know it's out of warranty. Just I just want the battery, and they wouldn't replace it. And I, I came up here, and you guys opened it up. You looked. You said, well, it's probably not really water damaged. I mean, it looks like there may possibly, but not anything significant. And it probably is the battery. You replace the battery. I paid $100 or $120 or whatever it was for the battery. And the thing chugged away for four years. Yeah, that's um, great. And and I wouldn't have gotten that if I had gone, ironically enough, to the manufacturer to do that. But, I mean, you guys are the ones that are able to say, well, we can do this. And, and obviously, you didn't give it a warranty. Uh, the battery, I'm sure, was warrantied. But the, right. And nor, nor would anybody else, nor would you expect anybody else on a, you know, a machine that's that old. Now, how did you get into MacMedics. I mean, you you started this company. I did. You regret it yet? <laughs> Not yet. I love doing this. Um, I love helping people, and uh, this is a great way to interact one on one with folks who are Apple fans, just like me. And uh, I love helping people. So, what I noticed was way back in the day that Apple dealers were sort of treating 
service as an afterthought. That was back when computer margins were way better than they are today. So in order to be an Apple dealer, you had to have a service department. And those dealers, it's kind of an afterthought because they were looking for the sales back in the boon day of selling computers. Right. So I sort of, just sort of by accident, sort of discovered this little niche way back in 1990-ish. You know, I could fix the Apple computer stuff at a component level. They were a lot easier to work on then because they had giant capacitors and stuff like that. I could get out my soldering iron and I could fix your Mac Plus or your Mac 128 or whatever. And I could replace a capacitor or the flyback transformer, which was a common failure, and do it at a fraction of the cost of what Apple could. Well, what's your what's your background personally? I mean, were you a, a tinkerer or a computer engineer? Or I'm a college dropout, and uh, I don't have any formal training, but I've always been involved with computers way back in the day. In 1979, my parents opened a computer store in Severna Park. It was the first one in the area, and uh, I worked there from junior high school all the way through high school. I'm thinking back, that was probably like the... TRS-80 days, type the, maybe the Commodore 64. <laughs> yep, we were an Atari dealer. So we sold Atari and uh, Epson and Compaq and uh, a few others, NEC. My mom, who started the business, she was uh, a huge Epson printer dealer and sold dot matrix printers like out the door all day long. Dot matrix, that's a v v v v. I remember that noise. <laughs> Oh, my word. That's, that takes me way, way back. What Apple bug bit you? Well, I was actually anti-Apple back in the Everybody Atari. Everybody was anti-Apple, I think, Back in the point. Atari days. But this little niche I found was something that I've just uh, continued to work at for a long, long time. And it's become quite the enterprise. And uh, you know, we have thousands and thousands of customers now and a couple dozen employees and... Lots of really exciting, cool places that we go and big projects that we work on. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So you're not just this retail store that's, I mean, as I look around, I mean, you've got, you know, new and used Macs. Um, so this is a perfect place to go if you've got a student that needs a computer in high school or somebody heading off to college. Um, that's correct. You know, if, if you're not sure you want to spend the money. And personally, what I'll say is that, I mean, I was the... On the phone, the Android guy at first, and I was definitely a PC guy. Actually, I started, my very first computer, I think was, I think I did some of those TRS-80s or Commodore 64s or whatever they were, but one of my first computers was an Apple IIc. Yep, could have been Apple IIc or the Apple IIgs. Yeah, which was like the little nine-inch green monitor with the keyboard that slid underneath it. And I got turned off. I got turned on to PCs because they were more affordable and everything else. But boy, I'll tell you, when I switched back to you know, a laptop, a MacBook. Yes, they're more expensive. There's, you, you can't argue that a PC or certainly a Chromebook now, um, but boy, they last and they work. And I remember back in the days when everyone was trying to figure out how to synchronize data as everything started moving to the cloud and all this, you know, odd thing up in the sky, like what is this cloud thing? Uh, Apple really seemed to have it and figured out how to do it and do it right. I mean, I know if I put in an appointment in my phone right now, I can go home. I know it's going to be on the and, and that always wasn't the case with PCs. I mean, I think the Androids have probably gotten their act together now, but uh, I've been a fan ever since. But you said you do much more than just what the store is here. Yeah, I got my start driving around doing, you know, computer service. And then I gradually started doing consulting for advertising agencies. That was a big user of Macintosh computers, people that were in the creative arts to produce ads and Newspapers and magazines and pre-press printers were another one that uh, I helped. And as time went on and we had more and more employees in the field doing that kind of work, it still remains something that we continue to do. Like, for instance, we do the Apple support for the Baltimore Ravens and the Red Cross and Geico and uh, hundreds of other big to small companies who who need Apple support. So you go out go out on site and take care of then they, would you do that for a home person? Yep, we do them for, for home users as well. So if there is a we'll say a senior that's that's got a MacBook in a, a nursing home or a continuing care center that may not be able to drive or something like that, you can come and help them. Yep, uh, we see people at Ginger Cove in Annapolis all the time. We have a bunch of regulars who live there. 
That's fantastic. Well, I mean, it sounds like you're, you said the Ravens. I mean, you probably got, I know my, my son is in IT at the university system. And I remember I had a friend that way back in the pre-digital camera days, he worked at like a, a one hour photo processing things. And he used to have all the stories. I'm sure that you, with the repair work and everything else, you've got a, a bunch of stories that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've seen it all for sure. You know, you know everybody's secrets. <laughs> or not really, but. Uh, yeah. A lot of interesting work over the years. The retail, I never wanted to be in retail because I saw my parents' computer store basically go out of business because, like, the big box stores like Sears and Montgomery Wards were selling Atari That's computers. Right. And uh, that pretty much put my parents out of business back in the dawn of Circuit City type stores where just a little mom and pop computer shop just couldn't keep up anymore. So I swore I would never do retail, but we couldn't really escape it. When um, I outgrew my home office for the consulting and service business, I, I ended up in like a flex, a flex warehouse space, which... It's not really like a retail spot. That was the one on the other side of 97, right? Uh, it's actually uh, on this side of 97 was my first office. And then I went to the other side of 97. But it was just like a base for our corporate consulting, really. We were never intended to be retail. But we're like, okay, if people want to come visit us to have, you know, if John Frenet wants to come get his Mac fixed, we're here. We're already doing repair work for others. Why can't the general public come visit? And just over time, word got out. And uh, we just couldn't hold back the floodgates. We have so many people who want to see us that that's why we have this building now. And we just changed our location in Lanham to be uh, a more retail-friendly place. Okay. Well, this is a real retail-friendly location. And this, you, what have you been here, about five, six years? Yeah, it'll be six years this year. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. But, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great showroom. Uh, and again, what I like about it is when you walk in, there's somebody here that can greet you, that can sit there and talk to you about it. It's, uh, you know, tap your name into an iPad and, and, and sit around and wait. Uh, right. If you need, if you need service, my recommendation is you call, let them know what the problem is. They'll tell you when to come up and you know, your service is wonderful. I mean, I know I had, uh, as every car mechanic will tell you, the frustrated, the periodic issue, you know, there's a, there's a noise in the car. What's it sound like? Dun, dun, dun. You know, my my iPhone, the screen was just sort of going crazy and flickering. And you guys came in and you said, you know, we're not seeing it. We're not seeing it. And you said, you know, we could replace the screen. It was out of warranty. But they said that would be, I can't remember how much it was. And they said, but, you know, if we can show that it's doing it, Apple will cover it under a, a recall or something along those lines. And I said, okay, well, I'll leave it here. I'll go to Starbucks down the road and got some coffee and hung out there, did some work and came back. And they're like, no, we washed it for two hours and didn't do anything. I'm like, of course, that's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my phone and all of a sudden it starts to do it. He grabs it out of my hand, quicks, runs it back to the back room, jams the, I guess, the plug in the bottom of it. And the Apple magic machine reads it. And he says, yeah, we got it. So now Apple turned around and um, replaced it. You know, through you guys, obviously, the, the you know, under, under warranty, put a whole new front you know, screen in the, the front place of that. And when I was driving home, I was like, this never would have happened at the mall. It would have plugged in. It's like, yeah, no, there's nothing going on here. You m must be a figment of your imagination or, you know, call us when it does it again. And, you know, there's a guy that was here that worked on it that said, you know, you know I don't believe you're nuts. But he stuck with it. And it really shows that you guys are looking out for the customer as opposed to, you know, the necessarily, I mean, obviously you've got to mind your bottom line, but the bottom line, I mean, you know, sure, would you like to have had the whatever cost to replace it? I'm, I'm sure you would have, but this obviously works to making a loyal customer coming back and back time and time again. What are some of the bigger things that you've done? I mean, I know you said Ravens and, you know, do you have any, any like, oh my gosh, do I believe we're working with these people type stories? I do. Back in the Clinton administration, I got a call from the White House and the caller ID showed up. It just had a number, didn't say the White House. And uh, they were like, how soon could you have a tech in D.C. to take a look at a situation? And I said, well, it might take me a little bit. And they're like, it's it's kind of an emergency. Would it would be possible to get someone here today? And I said, well, possible. Let's see what we can do. And they're like, well, this is the White House. We have a situation we want you to come look at. And I said, okay. They're like, you have any problem giving us your social security number so we can clear you to come down to visit? 
I said, no. So 10, 15 minutes later, they're like, you're, you're clear to come. Come on down. Go to the old executive office building. Give us a call when you get here. I said, okay. So uh, me and one of the guys from my team went to New Carrollton, jumped on the Metro, got to the White House, got in there. They had told us a little bit about what they thought the problem might be. So we brought all these crazy tools and stuff to look at it. So the Secret Service had to, like, X-ray our bags and go through everything. Did you think it was a prank call at first? No. The person on the phone sounded pretty legit. Pretty professional and serious? Yeah. (laughs) So I found myself in, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the title it is, but it was, you know, a corner office in the old executive office building. And I think it was uh, chief counsel to the president, basically the, the president's lawyer. And uh, they had a Mac that they needed data recovery on. And uh, with some hoops and jumps and things that we had to do with partners, we were able to get the data from this laptop. And they were like, whatever you do, don't look at the data. And I was like, okay. So I got the data. It was on a CD. And I called them up to let them know I had it. And they're like, okay, do me a favor. Can you take a peek at it and just see if you can see any, like, funny business in there? And all the file names were, like, you know, right out of the news, you know, Madeline Albright meets with person X and this person does that. And I was like, I don't see anything. I don't really know what I'm looking for. And I was like, well, I'll drop it in FedEx and uh, you're good to go. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. Please hand deliver it. I said, okay. <laughs> so back to the White House I went and hand delivered it. I think you're a Russian spy. Well, hand, hand, hand delivering, dropping data in, <laughs> in front of the White House. It was a little bit surreal because... Uh, they gave me the person's computer bag with all their stuff in it. They took me down to a little secret service office. It was like one of those Dutch doors, and there was a guy basically standing in a closet who was the property officer, and he issued the property to me. And there I am on the Metro clutching this guy's bag with his (laughs) business cards and everything in it, and I started to worry, (laughs) am I in a Tom Clancy novel? I'd, I'd imagine your uh, your mind does go a little bit a little bit crazy. It is right out of a Tom Clancy novel. Yep. Interesting segue because I also did work for Tom Clancy for many many years. Do you have, do you have that un, unpublished uh, manuscript somewhere around? No, I do not have the unpublished <laughs> manuscript. Though I was tasked to try to find it after he died. Really? Is there apparently an unpublished manuscript? There is not. Okay. As far as I know. Oh, that's that's wild. So when he passed away, his estate or his family had asked you to. Yeah, I had all I had to grab all his files and go through and catalog it for his estate. So I, I did a, a file catalog of every single hard drive that he had and it went into like a little SQL database just so that they could see every single thing that was there. And you know, there was not the next great Tom Clancy novel, unfortunately. <laughs> but I did a lot of work for him over the years and uh miss working for him. He was a, a hilarious guy to work with. Very funny. Now, was he coming down here to Sperna Park? Or was oh, no. He, you were just going up to him? Yep. I used to see him at his uh, home in uh, Calvert County. Oh, that, that was that, he had that big um, place up on the on the yeah. cliff. That, yep. that so It was a camp or something, I think, yep. at one camp point. Camp Kaufman. Yeah. It was, uh, I think, a Jewish summer camp. Yes. yes. Way back in the day that he bought. That's really cool. Well, you, well, you talked about you know cataloging data and, and working with data. So I mean, you you're doing this as well. You're doing data recovery for the White House, uh, or you did it th- during the right. Clinton administration, and that, that's something. I mean, nobody backs up their computers until they lose stuff. That's that, then they become fastidious about backing them up. The first first crash when they lose stuff, I've, and I, I was victim of that a long time ago in a business when I owned a travel agency. It was like, oh. yeah, um, it's a terrible feeling. I'm actually. You may have heard me uh, voice the texting as you arrived here. I'm actually helping a friend trying to figure out where some data is that went missing. And it's not a great feeling. And this guy had a time machine backup running. And have two different time machine backups. And I actually made a time machine backup the last time I saw him. And I can't even see the data on that. I just don't know. It's like the data evaporated. We oh. just don't know where it went. We're, we'll find it, but there has to be an explanation, but... On the surface, it doesn't it doesn't look great when a file is just missing. But so if I've got a hard drive that is just that just fails, you know, my MacBook and I get that you know, crazy blue or the crazy rainbow wheel spin and then it just sort of dies and won't do anything like that. I mean, I'm like, okay, this is this is a, a dead puppy. I can bring that up here and you can probably resurrect it. We have uh, tools to get 
data off of a hard drive. We're not a clean room recovery place where the guys in spacesuits take it apart. Right. And we don't take drives apart, but we do have some tools that allow us to get data. We're a great stop in between the Apple store where they say you need data recovery and then going straight to data recovery that might cost $3,000. I just saw a bill from one of the big data recovery places and it was, I think it was 2,600 bucks for a full data recovery. So my data recovery starts at 199 and you know we're really vigilant and careful. We're not going to try to recover something that isn't recoverable and damage it further, but we do have some techniques that we can get data and we do get it on a pretty regular basis. That's good to know. One thing that I know Max and Apple products uh, have a reputation for being, uh, and I'll use the term, you might cringe at this, but like virus proof and resistant of the guests to a lot of viruses. And I, and I know initially someone told me that it was because of the preponderance of PCs that all the bad guys wanted to infect the PCs because they were the backbones behind everything else. And the Macs were just the creative types. Is that necessarily true that they're resistant to viruses by design? They are. Back in the day, the virus scale was certainly tipped towards the PC side of things, and it still is. But the Mac OS now, especially with Big Sur, it's so closed up. It it makes it very, very difficult to get a virus on, on a Mac. Now there's malware. Malware usually finds its way on because you want to do something and you're trying to get a job done and in the process of getting that job done, like installing Flash, which you've been behaviorally conditioned to do, you end up installing something that says it's Flash, but it's actually something else. Right. Now that Flash is gone because it was retired at the end of last year, uh, that's happening less and less, but we still see malware on a daily basis, stuff, garbageware, malware. And anybody who has a Mac can download malware bytes for free. The fastest way to find it is to go to adwaremedic.com, get a free copy of Malwarebytes, uh, use the trial version, and it'll find and delete anything that isn't supposed to be there. I use uh, Clam XVA, XAV, something like that. Yeah, that used to be a real favorite for guys in IT like me, but they commercialized it, and then it kind of lost some of its charm. Okay. We like Malwarebytes now. And the fact that it's free and fully functional in trial, is that's pretty much what we point people to. What about for maintenance on thing? What do you like that? I mean, again, I, I use the Onyx. So that's a great tool. It's not really built for everyday user, you know, soccer mom, NASCAR dad. That's not really a tool that you need to be careful. There's a, there's a disclaimer, I think, before you install it. You are uh, know, what you, know what you're doing You want to know what you're doing. And, and as long as your computer's healthy, it's a great way to tidy it up for sure because it'll. They, uh, Onyx has a sort of a, a dumbed-down version called Maintenance, which does pretty much the same thing that anybody can run, and it's generally safe to do. But you definitely want to be on your toes, and you never want to do anything unless you have a backup. Right. And backups are getting a lot easier now with the cloud and everything else. I mean, there's really no excuse not to. I mean, I know I've got a uh, external hard drive I purchased here that sits plugged into my laptop and I usually am in bed by midnight. So at midnight, I go ahead and churn away right, <laughs> and, and do your little backup. And, you know, sometime an hour and a half later or something like that, it's done. And it just incrementally backs up each night. And uh, hopefully I haven't lost anything when I... Uh, if, if I ever need knock on wood that I never need to recover it, but it is there, and certainly you can do it up to the cloud as well. Yeah, Time Machine, uh, I like to tell people, I believe it's the most powerful feature in the OS. It is free. Time Machine can be confusing because a lot of people, especially with the newer OSs, it has like a mini Time Machine that's built in for versioning. Mm-hmm. But in order to back up the entire hard drive, you need any external hard drive formatted for Mac and then you designate that as your time machine backup. But remember, you buy a rotating hard drive, and then you put it in service for time machine. It has a limited lifespan. It's a lot of churn on that drive over time, so you can't use a drive forever. After five years, it should probably be retired, and you should replace it with something better. You can use an SSD, or you can just keep buying a rotational hard drive. They work great. And remember, time machine is not a system for archiving files forever, where... You're like, oh, I don't need this file right now, but I might need it later. So I'll delete it off my computer 
and then I'll get it out of time machine later. No. It's not for that. If you do it accidentally, time machine will still have your file for as much time and space as it can hold on to the file. But time machine is set up to erase the retrospective data that it's kept. Of the prior file. After a certain period of time. Right. What is, uh, yeah, I mean, you've known all the Macs from way back when you were talking about. What, what do you think, as the Mac geek that you are, what's the best product Apple has put out? The best product? Yeah. Well, and that could be, that could be I mean, I, mean I, I laugh and I say that, you know, the people that are in their 90s right now have just seen so much change, you know, from, from vehicles to, you know, computers to coming out, the internet and telephones and, you know, everything else. But Apple's been around for, what, 40 some odd years now? Yeah, it's uh, been around for quite a while. What's the game-changing product that they've made? I really, I mean, I'm a Mac guy through and through, and I'll always have a Mac. But I think that iPhone is the most revolutionary thing that they've done. I mean, we're really talking about a computer in the palm of your hand. It really is like a tricorder right out of Star Trek. It's amazing, the stuff that it does, and linked with your Mac linked with the watch for health and you know sensing heart attacks I, I, i've got the apple watch i love the i love the linking on that yeah sensing a fall for an older person a heart you know somebody's having a stroke an apple watch or a heart attack can detect that and alert alert you or your loved ones it's just it's just amazing in your wildest dreams when you were selling atari at your parents store in saverna park way back when could you possibly imagine I never would have imagined it. Never, never, never. <laughs> Over into the computer realm, what's what's their best product? What's their best product right now? Right now, you cannot go wrong pound for pound with the 999, 256 gig MacBook Air with the Apple M1 chip in it. It is just a dynamite machine. Retina screen, good keyboard, 17-hour battery life. It's on fire. It's so fast. Also, the M1 MacBook Pro is excellent, and the M1 Mac Mini for $699 is bananas. It is absolutely a supercomputer. I've been toying with the idea. I mean, I've, I work primarily I work off of a 16-inch MacBook Pro that I purchased from you about two years ago. And I'm thinking my next purchase, I might go with that Mac Mini and get just two, perhaps even three external monitors. Yeah, the and- new Mac Mini will drive... If you look right over here, I have the Mac Mini set up, and it has a 40-inch Dell monitor on it. It'll actually drive two of those. And, you know, I mean, I figured that way, you know, you get the Apple keyboard. Yep. And it's just, you know, the Apple trackpad or the mouse or whatever, the magic mouse, and just let it go. And you never know. It's just you don't have the fancy flat screen in front of you, and it's obviously not slide it into your uh, backpack and take it off. I and mean, that's the thing that I may wrestle with is the portability. Yeah, I'm waiting. I love my laptop. I also have a 16-inch uh, MacBook Pro, and uh, I'm waiting for the Apple M1X or M1S or whatever the next incarnation is, that when it comes to the 16-inch, I'll, I'll definitely be a buyer as soon as available. What's the biggest dud? There aren't too many duds. Most of the computers are pretty time-appropriate. Uh, one computer that I really thought they shouldn't have made in the configuration they made it was the 11 inch macbook air with a 64 gig ssd and two gigs of ram soldered onto the logic board Is that, that really one, under really underpowered it's just 64 just two gigs of ram that you can never change is was a mistake expensive chromebook <laughs> <laughs> in the modern era i think that's the worst one they made okay but not because it was poorly designed it just for an extra few bucks, they could have pumped some more RAM in it. With 4 gigs and 64 gig, you would have something. But just with the 2 gigs, it just wasn't enough. Well, I will say their, their products tend to be very well made. Uh, not a lot of plastic in them. I know my daughter is notorious. I tell her if, if it can be plugged in, she can break it. And she had a Chromebook one time because she blew through. I think we had a Dell laptop, and she destroyed that in nine months. So he says, Okay, you're getting this 199 Chromebook, and if you can show me you can keep it for two years, then I'll think about getting you something else again. That was literally 30 days before she sna- somehow snapped the screen off. And I mean, ultimately, I uh, had I had to replace my MacBook Air, and I came here and got the other one, and I gave her my old one. I think you wiped it and freshened it up and everything else, and, and that lasted. So after using it for three years for me, 
lasts her an additional four years through college, one year through work, and she's just replaced it physically. It's, you know, open, it's closed, it, it feels a little heavier. I mean, it's not the, I mean, the MacBook Air is pretty light anyhow, but it's, you know, it's thin, but it's it's very well built. It's a very well built product for the most part. Yeah, it's a great machine. Macs have a tremendous half life. I often tell people you can expect to get about ten years of use out of them, and we see that pretty commonly. Uh, now, ten years is that like just casual? Is that the as you said, the soccer mom and the the? Yeah, even a professional could get some pretty good longevity on it. But for just a regular user, I mean, I bought my daughter uh, a 2012 MacBook Pro when she was a sophomore in high school. And it lasted her all the way through high school, all the way through college, and then another year and a half professionally. And after time, I think one of the battery cowlings was like a little screw, a little plastic part broke off the battery that the screw goes through and got stuck in the fan. And we could doing it on our own. She could just never get it out. So, you know, because I work with Apple, I finally upgraded her to something else. But that machine, I got it refurbished at Apple. I sent it, you know, back to Depot Service. And we sold it here in the store. And it's still living its life with another customer. Wouldn't wouldn't know anybody a penny after all that time. That's no, for sure. No, it was a dynamite machine. And that computer, there was a time where they were selling it for $9.99. And it's a great deal, just like now with the new MacBook Air for nine ninety nine. It's just a it's just a great deal for what it does. It is, it is. I mean, and you look at the different things that Mac or Apple has. I mean, you know, just the, the safety things. And I think I guess PCs probably have at this point, but the the Find My Mac feature, the Find My, I guess it's called now, where you can find your the Air Tags, which is something new that Apple has come out with, and the uh, you know, so you can find it specifically where your thing is or where your people are, where your I know when I had a, uh, I got broken into and I had my MacBook Air stolen, uh, I was trying to find it and it, it just never booted up. And the cops said that it was probably sold. Uh, you know, I, I did the whole, you know, disable and everything else, but it, you know, it never showed up. The cops said I was probably just sold 10 times for 25 bucks a pop just so people could get high and it's in a dumpster someplace and you know, no, no need to really worry about security. Uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that gets stolen here in the, uh, D.C. Metro, Baltimore area, it finds its way up to New York or Miami or someplace like that. Really? Yeah. And a lot of the stuff, they never turn it on. They just, they'll sell it for parts. That makes sense. That makes sense. How much of your business here is used versus new? I mean, you've got a huge inventory of, I say used, but refurbished. And I mean, those come with a warranty, right? Yep. Refurbished and used both. And uh, we have more than normal right now, but we sell mostly new and, you know, we sell, you know, some refurbished. Now, are the refurbished ones you get, are these, there's trade-ins? Most of them are trade-ins, yeah. Is that, is that, I mean, are you paying? You're not paying for a, a computer, are you, or are you? No, not usually. Most people are trading in. A lot of times what will happen is someone will bring in a Mac, you know, a MacBook Air that's, you know, the screen's damaged on and they don't want to wait for it to be repaired because they need a computer right now. Buy a new one, transfer the data. They'll buy a new one, we'll transfer the data, they'll leave the old one with us, and then maybe someday down the road we might refurbish it for sale. And then and then put the new screen on and and set it up. And again, I I mentioned earlier, but it's it's a perfect opportunity when, you know, we're getting now into the back to school time that you know, if you've got a kid that is going into high school that needs a computer, uh, whether it be maybe for at home or to carry with them to school or certainly going into college, you know, you've got tons of, you know, tons of them here. Yeah, we usually have at least a dozen or so out on the counter. And just like you said with uh, your daughter, if you don't want to trust your computer, you know, a brand new computer to a person entering high school, you can buy a computer for essentially half the cost or less. Right. And... That might be enough to get them all the way through college, but maybe not invest in a brand new one and still get a great one. I have a lot of parents who come in here who are for college, will buy a $500 computer and the other $500 is for books. And that's like a book. Right, a book, yeah. <laughs> in, some, in some, some schools, that's for sure. And, you know, again, the, and the, the lines here are non-existent for the most part. Usually. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've been here opening and there's a couple people out, and I know uh, you know during COVID you you know you had specific things because I mean you're you're basically you're a high touch type of a of a thing. I mean people are going to put their fingers and everything else all over their computers, so that makes sense. But again, you know you you call up, you find out what what the problem. Yeah, come on in. We're open, and you're pretty much a retail. You're I want to say nine to five, but I mean you know that's what it is. I mean you don't have these 
10 p.m. hours because you have a life. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you do have the weekends. We are open on the weekends yep. now, 10 to 1. So, on and, and it's, it's well worth the trip. I mean, I think you're going to find by the time you don't wait in line here, it's a much better experience. It's a much better um, value in the end because I think that uh, despite the fact that – I'll diss on Apple a little bit, but they, they claim to hire geniuses in the store. Uh, let's face it, they're a bunch of kids that put in applications that went through a, probably a two-week training period on some real basic stuff there. And they, I'm sure they've got some techs in the back. But for the most part, you know, these are kids that are that just know the computers very well, probably better than you do. And uh, but they're not the ones that are able to really guide you through a purchase uh, like you would get up here at MacMedics. No, nah, probably not. There's some real professionals working at Apple, obviously, but they are just getting crushed by the masses because it's the Apple store and it's just a fun place to go. And there's so many people there. But one of the things you mentioned earlier was, I mean, going to the Apple store, especially for an iMac or a Mac Pro Tower or one of the larger pieces of Apple gear, where you can literally park right at my front door and you can bring it right in. You do not have to carry it through JCPenney or through the mall to get it into the Apple store. So that's a huge, a huge thing. Oh, without that. And I'll tell you, I think the Apple store in the mall gives me a headache since they redid the ceiling. And the whole ceiling is like one giant fluorescent light. I walk in there and I get like almost a migraine because it, it's, I guess, the little vibration in the tubes or whatever's above it. It's uh, Although I do like the um, shopping with the uh, app, the Apple app. Oh, yeah. That works great. Because you, you sort of feel like you're shoplifting. And say, so, yeah, I'll take this. Yep. <laughs> and walk out. I don't know how they prevent that, but it's it's kind of funny. So you don't, you don't have that here, but you do have all the products uh, for the most part, with the exception of the watch and the phone. Here you've got the accessories. I was looking over at your rack over there. You've got the little keychains for the uh, Apple tags, all sorts of cords and chargers and everything else that you could possibly need. And uh, what they don't have, you can probably order it all in, right? Oh, yeah. We have pretty much every cable, power adapter, and dongle that apple makes in stock and then a lot of stuff that apple does in stock weird cables for video and anything that you need for hooking a mac up i usually have right and lots of them it's always good to know i know that uh you know my ipad uh was here and i had the uh the smart key smart folio keyboard which i love and i think i waited a couple of days for the because i wanted a, a little bit beefed up with what you had in stock i think i, I can't remember what i got the 12 12.9 Pro, which had a little bit more memory, I think, than a friend of mine told me a long time ago. Said, you know, you buy buy as much power as you can with your with your <laughs> with your money. Uh, you never go wrong with that. Don't don't cheap out on that. And I, I do that with phones as well. It's you know, even though I don't use it. What is um, the best bit of advice you can give to anybody that owns a Mac or a computer? I just go go back to the backup. You got to back up that data, and don't back it up once. Back it up twice. Back it up three times if you can. And you'll thank me down the road because if you're ever in a situation where you've lost it all, it is just a horrible, horrible feeling. I mean, you could be talking about 10 years of your digital life, photos, tax documents, credit card statements, stuff that you need. You just don't want to lose it. Time machine is great. You can run more than one time machine. You can copy some really important stuff on a flash drive just as an emergency, emergency backup iCloud is good, but iCloud only backs up your documents folder and your desktop folder, and then your photos only if you opt in for iCloud photos. Right. That can get a little expensive. I really like the iCloud backup for the iPhone, where it's a dollar a month for 50 gigabytes. I think Backblaze is a better choice for backing up. It'll back up your whole computer, and I think that's 7 or $8 a month. And um, I think you can back up to f- four or five devices up. With that, Every, everything's going to subscription now. Yep, it's, everything's a subscription. And figure out, and it's it's definitely well worth it. And I do know that whenever you drop something off for repair here, the the uh, first question is is do you have a backup? Do you have a backup? <laughs> oh. That's right. And then if the answer is no, then there's that big long form that says basically if something happens, it's on you. Yeah, well, we just try to get people to back up, and we ask people if they have a backup more as a form of education, not as a sales tactic, just because we want your data to be protected. And a lot of people think, because Apple is so high quality and people have this thing in their head that iCloud is going to, they get confused that they may be paying for their iPhone, they're not necessarily paying for their Mac. So we Rolls always- Rolls Royce is going to the shop too. 
take it. <laughs> That's for sure. Dennis Steibel, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for letting me come in here after hours uh, to peruse the goods that are here. And uh, it's funny, I just dropped off a uh, an old MacBook Air that my daughter had to see if we can get it cleaned up and reformatted and wiped down. And I, uh, if it's still in worthy condition, I'm probably going to donate it to somebody that uh, might be able to use it. That's a good thing, but I appreciate it. And um, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening to this week's Local Business Spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.